Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, Evis, Howard, everybody that was uh, in the organization of this, which is a great program. And I'm very happy to see so many friendly and dear friends in the audience. And as Evis said, if you have an idea for a paper, put it on. <laughs> How fabulous. I'm gonna share very briefly with you work that we have been doing in Kansas City, Kansas. And uh, this is a paper that is currently under revisions for a journal and we have entitled it Between Buen Vivir and Development. And Buen Vivir is well-being in Spanish. An Urban Community Capitals Assessment in Latinx, Kansas City, Kansas. And what we wanted to do here was examine the dynamics of spiraling up and spiraling down of community capitals in Kansas City, Kansas, which is the enclave where there is the largest Latinx population that we have in the metro area. So this refers to the identification or the inventory of such capitals, their quality and trajectories, the way they interact with each other, the contributions that they make to community development, and from there, make recommendations on what communities and public agencies can do to make community development better. If you have seen it, uh, community capital framework is a capital that contemplates seven different types of capitals and their interaction. So it, built capital is included in that of particular connection to urban planning, but also political, social, human, cultural, natural, and financial capital. And this allows for us to avoid the economicist, myopic view that many community development planning and program have, focusing exclusively or almost exclusively in economic or financial capital, but it gives a more holistic perspective of what's going on in a community at large. We did primary research, secondary research, and then a case study on housing that I'm not going to be getting at in this presentation. Uh, but mostly of our primary data is collected through interviews of key community leaders in the Latinx communities, participatory workshops, and visual surveys for the case study. And what we found fairly rapidly after and during collecting this data uh, is that there was a mixed bag of spiraling up and down of capitals and dynamics in the community. There were some that were robust and growing, there were others that were diminishing and really weighting down in the community. Uh, the ones that were promoting growth and well-being, which here appear in green, were mostly the natural, the cultural, and the social capitals. And we found out that these were mostly capitals that were in their nature endogenous, that is cultivated by Latinos themselves within their communities, agentic. They did the work themselves and mostly non-capitalist. They were not about growing wealth or accumulation. They were about well-being. And uh, we found out also that these strong repositories of social and cultural assets were foundational for well-being and for the spiraling up dynamics to function. On the other hand, or on the flip side of this, we had spiraling down capitals in red here, and they were mostly in the arenas of the financial, built, and political capitals. And these were mostly functioning in manners that were structural. They belong to the larger society as opposed to the community itself, exogenous and capitalist. And uh, not because we say that, uh, we are only suggesting that external intervention were the only ones capable of doing a dent on them or solving them, but they needed a, a combination of endogenous and exogenous intervention to be able to be flipped around, to be growing, or at least uh, to balance out in manners that were not diminishing the well-being of the community. So ultimately, we want to uh, 
speak a little bit about the dialogical relationship between when vivir or this notion of well-being that mostly come from indigenous communities in Latin America and is the notion of living well in the within the bio capacity of your ecosystem having the basics to support the dignified human existence uh, and this focusing on well-being was nurtured and in turn nurtured human, social, cultural, and natural capitals that were strong in the community and that were of more endogenous nature. And this contrasted with the notion of development that is usually embedded in many planning proposals and processes uh, that mostly results from exogenous financial and political capitals. And sometimes communities are very poor in these capitals. And when that is the case, and when you don't have those resources to start up a community development project, it might make sense to explicitly focus on when vivir or well-being instead, because once you build that basis, then you can put other capitals on top of that. And even if you just stay on the basis of well-being, you are already guaranteeing uh, support for that community in, in manners that is going to be uh, carrying them forward. Thank you. Okay, so we have like three minutes for questions or comments. Anyone? Um, you know, feel free to put your questions in the chat if you want to as well. Yes, I, I have a question. Um, in, in terms, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm so trying I, I, to figure I, out how to stop sharing the, the screen. You already did. I did? did? Okay. Yes, yeah. did. Right. Thank you. <laughs> right. I, I'm just trying to, to, to get a sense of the measurements of the um, being vivid. How would you measure? What are some of the, the measurements that you know it has been um, achieved? Yes, this was a qualitative research. We did interviews, we did focus group, and we played with Play-Doh with a lot of community members and they represented with Play-Doh capitals in their communities. Why, what they saw was working out for them and they saw in abundance in their communities and, and what they were missing or what they, they were actually uh, uh, not having in their communities that they needed. And, uh, and all of those were expressions of, of how they mm -hmm. perceived of the capitals. Okay, but the, have you looked at the, um, there's this sort of global index that they are using. Um, uh, the, the term is passing me now, but it's sort of a, the index of, of happiness and, and well-being. Did you try to sort of fine-tune your index, your indices with those to see if they're, you know, we can scale up at a global level to measure other communities across the world as it relates to, um, you know, well-being? That's a very good idea. That's something that remains to be done. We were mostly focusing on the conceptualization of the seven capitals. And we, in our workshops, we explained the capitals and we had posters that also had graphic expressions of what constituted the capitals so that the community could refer to the examples or, or expand on the examples that we were, we were giving. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So we don't have time for um, more questions. Um, I'm the next presenter. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is that if you want to like look at the chat, if people did have questions and you want to bring that as a conversation at the, at the end, I think that that would be um, great. All right, so again, my name is Iris Garcia Zambrana, assistant professor at the University of um, Utah. And today I'm going to be talking about the Western Leadership Institute. It's actually a class that I teach. I have taught it in English and Spanish. Um, the idea is like to like give like um, funding to like uh, community groups. And um, they are, they come in teams. 
so for something that they want to do and then they take this like leadership class that is I taught um, at, at the University of Utah through continuing education. Um, it is targeted geographically um, because it's like a, a partnership with like a community development corporation, Neighbor Works. Um, so they are like concentrated in the west side um, because there's a lot of like Latinos and other immigrants living in that part um, of town. Um, and again, it's also a partnership um, between the university with like an organization that is like uh, it has a satellite in the um, in the west side. Um, so as you think about it, it's like uh, a service learning organization dedicated to that uh, space. Um, so the idea is like it is like it, it actually received funding from a foundation. Um, actually, like neighbor works also like funds it. Um, and professors at the University of Utah get actually a release for teaching this class. There's a curriculum available, and Neighbor Works actually sells this curriculum if you're um, interested in that. Um, everybody can target the class to whatever they want. I'm a planning professor, so I have targeted to um, community uh, planning, just like framing an issue, thinking about like vision goals and objectives, uh, finalizing with like evaluation. And um, a lot of the things that people are, have been doing projects are about food security, environment, public health, public art, place making, and different issues in planning. Here is an example of like what a student um, did. So she, uh, there's actually like these billboards. Um, there's a company that put these and they're like vacant lots. So she organized to actually make them into like a garden. Um, and she like did this like with her, with her neighbors. Uh, so the idea that they, in this class is like they are um, connected to many resources. Like for example, they go to like Capitol Hill and they thought about like how to uh, advocate for something with the legislator. Um, they're also like taught to go to Univision and like get their word out about the project that they're doing in their, in their community. Um, the, there's also connections in the University of Utah. So part of the idea that the West Side was chosen because the uh, educational attainment uh, is like 13% in comparison to like about 50, more than 50% in the in the East Side. Um, so the idea is like they actually like come to the university, they feel welcome in the university, they get actually like a student ID, they can use the library, um, and they can use it actually like any time as long as they register, even after the class um, ends. And here are my students, and they uh, have an, a graduation uh, for this like program. And actually, we after the graduation, they can join an incubator um, where they learn to do like businesses and also like nonprofits or um, furthering the work that they're doing. And these are like some of the accomplishments so far. So I have been for 500 graduates because this started actually in 2004. Um, there has been more than 80 community um, projects. There has been like 10 nonprofit created and, and maintained. And also part of what we are trying to do is like um, uh, just actually um, train people as, as leaders so they can um, be in the planning commission, they can get elected into the legislature, and we have like a lot of like success stories about that. So in terms of like the asset-based community perspective, what I concentrate a lot is like how institutions can facilitate residents in residence um, work. Um, and in this case, obviously through the university and the, and the CDC. So thank you very much. So I have like uh, five minutes for questions, comments. Uh, I cannot hear you, Teresa. I just wanted to ask you like, um, how many hours, was this a regular class or how many hours? It's a regular class. So they meet like three hours um, during the week. And they meet uh, most of the time in the community. 
And there's two places that they meet, like the Neighbor Works, which is located there, and also a community learning center. Um, and sometimes they come to the university in order to create those connections. Uh, Clara, you're muted, I think. Uh, no, oh. I, I think that the model that you presented is similar to what Jake Wagner uses here in the Center for Neighborhood in Kansas City. So I'm wondering if there are many models for such Center for Neighborhoods and whether you are connected and helping and, and, and learning from each other. We have not, although I have heard of it before because like there's a um, Daryl, who is like at ABCD Institute, he's a faculty, and like he he tells me about um, the institute. But that's like it's a great idea, Clara. It's like one of those I must do. Okay, <laughs> thank you for bringing that up. Uh, can I can I make a comment? Yeah, we have like three more minutes. Yeah, I think that that's very good. It's a little bit similar to what they were doing in LA with the, I don't remember the organization. I think that I remember that it was something action for uh, a just economy. And they used to teach uh, um, uh, several classes in planning to the community, but they were not linked to the, to the university, you know? Um, and about the, um, a exchange of experiences uh, that Clara mentioned. You know, I don't know if these um, still exist, but um, there was a conference that it was called the Neighborhoods Conference and different kind of organizations outside the academia. I mean, these were neighborhood uh, organizations, community organizations, nonprofit, etc., And they used to get together in this uh, very big uh, conference. I remember that I saw them like a couple of years in, when I was in Arlington. And I don't know if they are still doing it and what their current agenda uh, is, you know. It's just an idea I mean, to check it out. Well, thank you, Teresa. And if you would, again, think about a link or something, I think that that would be very, very helpful. Yeah, let me, I, I'll look for it and I'll let you know. I still receive the messages from Sashe. So uh, I, I can send it to the group. Excellent. Um, well, Michael is in LA, he's near LA, so I guess he, he lives in Long Beach. So I guess that he can also. Michael, are you there? Yeah, it, I think it's um, Michael Mendez. Michael. Uh, yes. Yeah. Am I next? So confused. <laughs> yeah, because of the short. Uh, so I think that's it for me. Thank you so much, um, everyone. So the, our next presenter is like Clara. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Evis and Howard, for putting this together, uh, and for every presenter. Wonderful to learn from everybody. Uh, I am Lara Furtado. Uh, I'm at the University of Fortaleza in Brazil, professor of uh, science for the city. I'm an architect and I do a lot of work uh, with communities in, in Brazil. Uh, and today I want to share with you uh, a uh, case of. Uh, Uh, let me see where I can put uh, blah, 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 to present. There you go. All right. A case that's very dear to my heart. Uh, and uh, I hope, uh, I hope uh, you enjoy it as well. Uh, so I'm going to focus specifically on the role of community memory uh, and culture and how it's been used to claim urban rights in Fortaleza. And I really want to share with you the, this specific group. It's called Acervo Mucuripi, which is called Acervo is Archive in, in Portuguese, and Mucuripi is the name of the neighborhood. So you can actually follow them on Instagram and on Facebook if you want to see. But uh, you can actually see here that it's written that uh, the archive is a memory project uh, for community, for the community mem memory 
of neighborhoods and informal settlements of this neighborhood called Mukuripi, right? And so this is a, this is a, a, a project that is all volunteer based and they, they, they are aware and their mission is to fulfill a social role of connecting people. And they do that through photography and by showcasing and by highlighting and giving uh, a voice to the cultural identity of this informal neighborhood, right? And uh, the, 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 their main goal is to promote their memory and their heritage. And you can see here that the community is actually really well located close to the waterfront. And it's been kind of uh, uh, dominated and there's this dichotomy and the struggle between these high income, right? High rises that are built nearby but they also have a lot of pride in the fact that they're close to the ocean and that they are they consider themselves to be a beautiful beautiful neighborhood um and the you can see through their posts on social media and all the activities that they organize that there's a lot of um love and a lot of pride right so um they take and they post all these pictures that are very very uplifting and they're very positive words so you can see um the Great Mukuripi encompasses several different kind of settlements with different names. So one of them is Chitanzio, so they say Chitanzio of Love, and one of them is Servilui, so they call it Servilui of Light, right? So there's a lot of uh, uh, positive imagery, and, and they're highlighting all the time the, the, the assets that this neighborhood has and the connection to the natural environment, such as the ocean. And so they promote a lot of these kind of interventions for beautification and the, the, the storytelling, right? So this, this painting talks about a place with good stories, movies, parties, soccer, carnival, faha, and fishing. So there's all, always this connection to the ocean, right? So this is, this is a, their, the project that these volunteers do. They also do a lot of work in schools that they have these activities with children where they highlight the fishermen and the culture of the fishermen uh, and the, the, they talk here, our neighborhood, our history, to instill children with kind of like the sense of pride, right, in their community. Uh, but also, this is not just done for uh, its own sake. Since they say they have a social kind of role, they take all of this kind of um, grassroots nurturing of cultural capital, and then they invest in to capital to to catalyze other capitals. So they invite other types of discussions such as the uh, extensive revitalization and gentrification that's been happening in the area, right? So they, for instance, this image shows the neighborhood in 1980 uh, and there were a lot of uh, homes built on the dunes and then they contrast this with, you know, this current, how it is currently now and all these homes have been moved and all these expensive buildings have been put, right? So. They, they in the legend that they post also says the effective map remains with affection but even though there are no more people the map that is now official does not include me in it right so they have over 5,000 followers and they use this platform to also highlight other issues that their neighborhood is suffering and uh, they, they talk a lot of they, they were big advocates during the World Cup uh, revital, the World Cup development projects, right? They removed a lot of houses. So stop and look around you, look at what is happening with the neighborhood, <laughs> right? So um, there is this kind of very clear message, and they also show the, the unequal disparities, right? So this is uh, like homes being built on stilts. And there's a right next to it, there's a yacht club, right? And so a lot of homes were also displaced to house this uh, yacht club. So, um, but also at the same time, they're using all of this visibility to promote beautification and to promote improvement in grassroots organizations. So they promoted houses being painted and cultural activities and recreational activities for community members and the youth. And something that has changed that uh, was the pandemic, right? And so they use this platform already to talk about the coronavirus and how that has impacted their community. And so they're using this platform to bring experts and to bring people to talk about how the coronavirus changes and impacts specifically communities. So this, 
the initial, they, they use this kind of history to bring followers and to build a sense of pride while also discussing other topics. And so what, one thing that has been very interesting was to see the democratization of having access to uh, 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 like platforms to speak such as the way we are now, and I'm in Brazil and I'm able to share with you. So these, the live movement, now we have lives for everything in Brazil, but this is a great example of a good live. And so on the left here, you can see Diego, he is one of the volunteers and he is promoting all these different lives about uh, sport, art, culture in their neighborhood, how heritage, education about heritage is important, how the youth, you can see here, protagonism, juvenile, how the youth is important, right? So they're bringing awareness to all these assets that exist in the community. And so I just wanna end by showing this process that has been taking place that they're promoting memory and heritage as an asset, but at the same time, they use that to highlight challenges and then there's a call to action. So I was only able to present very few interventions, but they have uh, brought communities together to um, collect food and distribute food. They have also been very actively involved in uh, inclusionary zoning regulations and been a part of board uh, urban, um, much more uh, structural urban processes. So I, I could go on and on, but I just thought it was an example worth sharing about how one kind of heritage cultural asset can bring about all these other assets. Thank you. So any uh, questions? Nobody wants to. Well, I'm very interested in her work because I do work in a neighborhood here in Ciudad Juarez. Um, they organize as well. I, I wanted to ask you, um, um, what kind of group initiated this in the first place? Are there people from the university, from schools, or from any other venues that uh, went to these neighborhoods and uh, started the group and what's the role also of um, Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, all these media in organizing and sharing uh, all this memory and um, and the events and everything you know. Right yeah it's a good question usually the university here uh, at least in Fortaleza is quite is quite involved with these organizations but this case specifically is an archive so it's called an archive and it's been a uh, past for all, from different people in the neighborhood since the 60s and there's this archive that's been built and there was this one lady that started this archive and then when she passed away her nephew start uh, continued and has collected uh, and gotten more volunteers to be a part of it so this really is a, a an autonomous kind of project of somebody that was very passionate about it and that got different youth and different volunteers in it and so the the universities contribute in trying to maintain this archive in different ways so the history department has helped with digitizing a lot of the archives and, and things mm -hmm. like that uh, the architecture um, the architecture courses like me with my students were planning like a tactical intervention so there's ways that we collaborate but really the maintain the maintaining of it is all by them and uh, yes, it, it, Facebook, it, Facebook and Instagram are the, are the main platforms used in Instagram even more so because he, he, he has all these old imagery. Uh, and WhatsApp is more for uh, getting people to, 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 to call, call for action, right? So that's how they, yeah. And I'm very interested in the role of these medias, right? And how they yeah. have changed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk later. <laughs> um, so, or thank you so much, Lara. Our next presenter um, is Leon. Uh, and while like Leon uh, gets ready, I just wanted to like um, mention that the asset-based community development book, like the building communities from the inside out, that green book that many of you probably have, it didn't identify the culture, history, and stories. 
uh, assets. It wasn't until like 10 years later that they're like, hey, culture, history, and stories are an asset in itself, right? That's how we share about all the other um, assets. So again, thank you so much. Um, Dion, are you ready? <laughs> You're on mute. So if Leon is not, is not, are you ready? Because we can find the next uh, presenter and then see is if we need to solve an issue. So it seems like that's what we have to do. So let's see, and then I'll, I'll text with him. So the next presenter will be then Michael Mendez. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Again, it's Michael Mendes. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Let me share my screen with you for just a moment. Okay, um, I'm trying to keep my uh, presentation to one slide, sort of a poster style, to make sure I keep within the five minutes. And I want to just uh, start off that I, I kind of fell into this ABDC uh, kind of approach or community engaged uh, uh, participatory research approach along the research process because um, I recently finished uh, my book, Climate Change from the Streets, uh, which was published earlier this year. And actually, I'm really excited. It was just profiled by Bloomberg Opinion uh, last week. And I, when I came off of uh, this book, I wanted to start a new research project, particularly focusing on issues of intersectionality uh, between the climate justice movement as well as immigration rights movement. And this was going to be a, a strict academic, um, sole author type of research project. And as I started to do the initial field work and interviews with uh, key stakeholders, I started to see some of the some great connections in the case study. Um, in down in Southern California and the Ventura and Santa Barbara regions, in particular looking at the uh, 2018 Thomas wildfire, which was the largest wild, second largest wildfire in California's history. And this was uh, a unique uh, case study in which undocumented Im Latino and indigenous immigrants were essentially rendered invisible by government and other disaster relief organizations because of systemic uh, racism and cultural norms of who is considered a worthy disaster victim. Um, and I saw w within this um, rendering of undocumented Latino indigenous immigrants, two um, uh, community-based organizations really came to fill that void. The first is the Mixteco Indígena Community Organizing uh, Project, or MICOP, which is an uh, indigenous uh, immigration rights uh, organization based in Ventura, but also works in Santa Barbara. And then the second was uh, CAUSE, the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. And this is primarily an environmental justice organization. And so they work together to ensure that uh, these undocumented immigrants, migrant immigrants, uh, outdoor workers, farm workers were provided and safeguarded uh, during this uh, wildfire again, which was the second largest in California's history. So as I began to um, uh, uh, investigate this project, I really saw that this couldn't be a, a traditional academic project and that I really wanted to work um, with my cup and cause on this project both jointly in the research process of formulating the research question and also in the publication. So, so from that process, I, uh, I enabled uh, several key milestones. Um, the first was uh, having a scoping analysis workshop where I brought uh, community leaders um, from Ventura and Santa Barbara counties, as well as California state policymakers, uh, to a scoping analysis workshop uh, where we work with uh, my graduate students as well to really identify uh, what were the impacts to undocumented immigrants um, in the Thomas wildfire. And we see that uh, some of the, uh, based on that scoping analysis, uh, we were able to find out that there was four key uh, direct impacts to undocumented immigrants. The first is language access to emergency information, Worker health and safety rights. Many of these out there workers, particularly farm workers, we see in this photo, had to labor under harsh conditions and heavy smoke uh, during these wildfires to safeguard uh, uh, precious crops such as uh, strawberries and other uh, valuable crops, but they weren't provided um, any worker safety and protective PPE uh, gear. The second is the, uh, the issue of, uh, the third is the issue of immigration status and disaster aid. 
uh, because of their undocumented status, um, they, they were ineligible for federal disaster assistance and even at the, that time, state and local disaster assistance. And then finally, impacts on housing and transportation when um, the fire occurred and then the subsequent mudslides happened from the, the fire debris flows really severed the infrastructure um, system as well as really limiting the amount of housing available to um, undocumented immigrants in, in that area because the uh, housing supply is quite tight. Um, a second milestone was that we, uh, based on the scoping analysis, we provided input to the governor's uh, $50 million disaster planning grant for socially vulnerable communities. So uh, the governor's office took our scoping analysis, the key findings that we did jointly together, and this helped uh, inform um, a 2019 $50 million disaster planning grant. So these are uh, preparedness plans, emergency plans that really didn't look at uh, socially vulnerable communities such as uh, migrant workers and undocumented immigrants. A third milestone is uh, later um, that year in October uh, 2019, we did a follow-up uh, briefing uh, to the governor's uh, Office of Emergency Services. We were, were able to um, detail additional findings that we uh, did as our research team. And then uh, fourth is that we're co-authoring an academic journal for GeoForum. We resubmitted it uh, with revisions. The, the editor-in-chief asked us uh, and provided us with an additional thousand of words to cover the issue of COVID-19 because a lot of the impacts that happened during this Thomas wildfire um, overlay with what we see uh, with COVID-19. So there's cascading um, impacts or compounding impacts that are happening. And the lessons learned that from the Thomas wildfire are, are informing COVID-19 um, uh, guidance and um, assistance for um, farm workers um, in the fields in Santa Barbara and the, and the Central Coast area. And then another um, uh, final milestone is that I, we help provide these community um, organizations with connections to uh, uh, philanthropic organizations and specifically to funders for uh, different forms of policy action. Uh, some of the future goals that we hope to do uh, in this joint um, community-based research project is to uh, apply for uh, more grants together and as our journal article and a couple other research product, products that we're working on come out to continue to do policy breaking briefings, not just at the state level, but next at the regional and local level. So that's a, a big snapshot of sort of um, what um, I've been doing in terms of community-based uh, participatory research. It, uh, this project is called the Invisible uh, Victims of Disaster, Understanding the Vulnerability of Undocumented Latino and Indigenous Immigrants. And I have, again, invisible uh, in parentheses because these groups are uh, actually not invisible, but they're rendered invisible because of uh, systemic racism and cultural norms about um, citizenship and uh, who's considered a, a worthy disaster victim. So with that, I'll open it up to um, questions. Okay. If there's any questions, if not, then uh, we can go to the next person. I, I think I was. Yeah, I don't know if Leon is like um, ready. Oh, well, we see if he's ready because the next one will be a night. But um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention that um, it's the work about um, disaster recovery around immigrants is very interesting because a lot of them obviously don't qualify for a lot of the federal assistance. Um, so it's like, again, very important um, work. And I was also like interested in like, you know, that they, the in Geoforum, they told you to add COVID. I wonder if that's like a new trend of like, kind of like, um, but you know, I think, I think that it's, it seems like, um yeah very interesting but i was wondering if there's like any other some insights that you go try try to change your work to like um fit it more into like the current uh situation um so i think with the issue with the COVID, that that was more of our work that uh we, we consulted with the editor about that because um my community um all the co-authors are at the front lines of the disaster and they're continuing uh, to work at um 
in, in the fields with some of these undocumented indigenous and Latino immigrants. And uh, there's a lot of similarities in terms of while one's a public health crisis, another is a, a disaster. Um, there are lessons learned and these are ca cascading uh, impacts that are happening um, in, uh, in the, out there uh, in the real world. And as scholars, I think we, we need to understand sort of those intersections uh, that these, in the, these socially vulnerable groups are experiencing, uh, one on top of the other. Um, Michael, I would like to have a question. Uh, let me see. Sure. I'm sorry if I'm asking. Yeah. Too much. And while Teresa has a question, if like I might, you want to get ready with your PowerPoint, that'd be great. Oh, that's okay. Uh, do I have time or should we start with the other? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm going to get ready the PowerPoint. Yeah, I really like what you are doing about the authoring of um, the community, that involving the community in the authoring of the of the of a publication. That's very good. I think that that's very uh, commendable. And I wanted to ask you, uh, immigration has changed right now very differently, you know, different groups. Um, and I think that it's getting probably, I don't know in LA, but right here in the border, it has become very um, different because the profile of immigrants has changed as well. And I wanted to know if um, since 2018, when all these new waves of immigrants arrived, if that has changed, um, uh, your work or uh, the challenges that you're facing? Um, no, I, yeah, I, I think constantly as researchers, our, um, our research is changing and particularly the world of uh, different the politics, the social um, institutions that we're dealing with really defines um, the impacts of these different groups. I think the biggest thing is really being able to tease out and making sure that um, Latino immigrants are not homogenized and particularly indigenous and immigrants from Mexico, Southern Mexico are not Latino. And really being able to uh, be in, in the meetings with the governor's office and be able to try to tease that out with, my, uh, with them and understand that these are a distinct culture and a distinct ethnicity that are, are not of uh, Latino or Hispanic descent. And these uh, come from distinct cultural traditions and languages and require special attention um, uh, during the disaster planning, preparedness, and recovery stages. So I think that's the biggest part is really, you know, fighting against this homogenization of all of immigrants, particularly Latino immigrants, and not really teasing out the different um, groups um, that come from Mexico that are all not Latino or Hispanic. Ooh, a whole new topic, you know, because yeah. of all the different um, conceptualizations of who is who. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, let's have like Anaï give her presentation. Thank you, Ives, and thank you to um, the other panelists and the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, can you hear me okay? Can I get a thumbs up from anybody that, thanks, Ives. Uh, so today I'll be sharing with you a little bit about a project. It's an ongoing project. Um, it's, I would say, in its early stage, despite the fact that I've been working on it for three years. So it's the asset-based community development in housing, uh, an ongoing journey to a community land trust. And I'm joining you from the city of Tacoma in the state of Washington, and um, from the representing the School of Urban Studies at the University of Washington in Tacoma. I have uh, so um, a little bit about how I got involved in this project, as I mentioned three years ago. It was part of my publicly engaged scholarship. So by this, I mean the op-eds, podcasts, community presentations, as well as one-on-one -on -one meetings that I have with community members uh, as part of my role as a community member myself, um, um, a local resident, um, a scholar, and an advocate for um, affordable housing approaches. And so the, the op-ed that I wrote was around the, a call for uh, the need for a land trust, a community land trust in the city of Tacoma. Not necessarily a novel, um, a novel topic, yet uh, I was trying to start a public conversation. 
Uh, and out of that, uh, out of that piece, I was there, I, I used that, that was like my presentation card. This was like the second year that I lived in the city and that was my way of getting um, my, my name out to community members. So out of those, I was invited to um, several, as I said, one-on-one -on -one meetings and community presentations. And specifically then I connected with a black and indigenous group. Uh, and within this group, um, I was connected to the land and housing liberation sub subgroup. And uh, I, I, I bring the, the, the imagery and also the information from this or the name of the subgroup as a way to explain the framework under which this, um, this group uh, organizes around. So this is about liberatory work. It is uh, very much grassroots, uh, community-led and um, Black and Indigenous-led group. So as we got to know each other on a, I, I met with, you could say the founder or um, one of the core members of the group uh, discussing my, my, my understanding of the need for a community land trust in a specific area of the city of Tacoma. And that led to future introductions to the group as part of forming what is now the long-term relationship that I have within this group. Um, they, after, I would say about a year of introductions and meeting and getting to know uh, the group and in some spaces sharing the, the concept, the idea, the, the, the ways that community land trusts work or could work, that led us to um, coming together and putting together a proposal to be the third host of last year's Res um, Planners Network Conference, Resisting Displacement and Dispossession, which was again aligned with the organizations or the, 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 the community groups interest focus area and what they're, uh, they're, they're trying to, to the, the work that they're trying to engage in. Um, and then that, that happened last summer. And then since then, the, or the group has been doing power mapping, mobilizing community members, um, identifying properties for a community land trust, uh, doing, they have a storytelling or uh, documenting storytelling uh, project led by local Black indigen and Indigenous uh, youth and then developing potential funding partnerships. And so my contribution to this partnership is as um, a connector in some uh, instances. In other instances, I am um, a supporter. In other spaces, I come as an assistant to the work. And uh, I'm, I'm being very intentional about how I show up for this group to ensure that the, the, the partnership is led by the community partners. So in our most recent project, the community reached out and said, we are, as part of our storytelling, as part of reaching out to potential funders and organizing, we need a timeline of housing. Um, and a timeline that goes back pre-settler colonial history so that we can tell like the story, not someone's story. And so this, this became a project that I worked on with several students where we um, we created a set of Google Slides and the, the reason why they're Google Slides is because they're very much the ownership of the documents, the, the product is on the community partners to use as they as they need them. Sometimes they print them out, other times they use them as part of their presentations with community partners, with um, mobile, with organizing organizations that they're um, meeting with. And so it's again, going back from time immemorial, talking about the indigenous people of um, the area where we live in the unceded territory of the Puyallup people, uh, talking about the Treaty of Medicine Creek. So like enc encouraging the, um, the understanding of the history of housing that brings them to the place where they are mobilizing today, looking at all of the, uh, all of the factors that br brought us to this moment, including um, Black migration from the 1800s, Chinese expulsion, like looking and making sure that we are uh, uh, addressing and acknowledging all of the um, the history that is not just white centered or euro eurocentric. 
Um, so talking about the Great Migration uh, and then looking at now more common day, more everyday topics that many other housing presentations allude to, such as race, racially restricted covenants, the Japanese expulsion that's also very recent in Tacoma, um, like the, presenting the actual maps and current day data for um, red line communities in Tacoma, and then leading to the, um, the handoff on the banning of discriminatory lending. Now, this is an ongoing timeline that uh, we continue contrib we continue contributing to to make sure that we're getting to um, today's um, to, to today's history of where we are in housing and what has led us to this moment. And so I'll stop with that. Those are my five minutes and uh, stay tuned. And I look forward to other spaces uh, where I can share with you all updates on where this project continues to go. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anais. Um, may we have like uh, time for one question? And after that, Leon, I think he's ready. Perfect. Questions for Anais? Hi, Anait, a question for you and everybody else. How do you balance your time between the things that you do with the community and the writing that you have to make on your own to be validated in academia? That is a great question. Uh, and it's a question that I know I'll be uh, exploring more and reflecting more on in a, a, a panel that, a round table at ACSP on what we called the carrying the two buckets. Uh, there's a, a group of other uh, scholars of color that will be presenting alongside me of like, that's what it is. So, so the balance GLADA currently is actually fairly unbalanced. It basically means that I'm running two parallel tracks. Today I presented to you all as, my, as a community engaged scholar, very clearly from the type of community engaged work that, as I said, this is the third year. There is no semblance of a publication in the horizon. That's not the reason I'm in it, um, but that's definitely not something that's going to be submitted in my tenure dossier that's going in this weekend. <laughs> so thank you. So not, not very balanced currently. Nice work. Yeah, so while uh, uh, Leon, you can like put your PowerPoints, but I just wanted to mention um, that I, I love the idea of like changing this like timeline and including different groups. Um, that maybe people have not paid attention um, like in the past. So it's like, it's a great, a great idea for me <laughs> and my co community and classes. So Leon, uh, I'm glad that you can show your PowerPoint now. Welcome. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I, I had a, a, a problem with my computer and the most stressful thing is that I was able to hear you all, but I, I, I cannot do anything. So I just reboot my computer. Um, for today, I'm going to talk about this project that I've been doing for the last three years with my advisor uh, in, in the University of Texas. I'm originally from Monterrey, Mexico, and that's where my research is located. Um, this, is, this is the, the area of Monterrey. Monterrey is a city that is only two hours and a half uh, uh, from the border, from the south border of the U.S. And this, the pre, this project is located here in this very consolidated area right now. And we have very close to this, air, to this informal community of La Campana, um, the most important uh, private university and the, the Monterey downtown. This is how it looks, a picture from this place. Uh, we can see this, uh, this uh, landscape of, of disparity of Monterey, these buildings in the back uh, is the district district area, which is one of the richest municipalities in Mexico, which is uh, San Pedro Garza Garcia. But the community is like this. The community has still still has a lot of problems with mobility, with lack of services, etc., lack of basic infrastructure. When we came to this community, uh, we established a, a partnership with with uh, the local NGO called Barrio Esperanza, which was working on the northern part of this polygon, but they wanted to use this juncture, this working with us, 
uh, and the local public university, the, the Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León, to explore a different area for, from, this, from this place to work with. And, and this was the, 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 the first area where, where we had the first meeting with the neighbors. And the, the, the idea was to turn this site filled with trash and debris into a community space. In the first meeting, residents decided this space to be a park. And the work with the community was delineated by the next pivotal points. That's the way my advisor and I have called them. First, one of the things that we identified is when we first talked with the NGO, we suggested an approach that the answer was no from the community. We did, uh, didn't act defensive, we just shift our approach and the NGO later told us that that kind of attitude was very well received uh, by them, as opposed to other uh, participations or other collaboration that they had in the past where the, the partners act defensively. So one of the things that we got from this is that, that, that planners should be constantly modifying their perceptions and suggestions ba based on the new discoveries and the continuous feedback from the partners. These rules are, are something that I am still working with and that, that I am still developing, uh, how to approach a community such as this one in, in Northern Mexico. Um, Entering to a community as an equal can only be achieved when a facilitator let go the assumptions and attitudes and let come new ways of learning and doing. We created this set of action rules, we, we, this mind, mindset of act, mindful action rules, we call them, to be constantly thinking about these things and, and be flexible the whole time. We're constantly re reflecting on our own positionality over there and also the attitude that we should have. The, this kind of work comes with many challenges. One of, one of these one, one, one of those is that in, in low income settlements in Mexico and in Latin America in general, there's a complicated history with paternalism. One of the first things that community asked us was, ¿Qué nos van a dar? what are you going to give us? Because that's the way uh, communities have related in the past with, with political parties or, or with um, uh, other researchers. So uh, just explaining the thing of co-creation or um, collaboration, what sounded strange and sounded um, an as an abstract, abstract idea, but little by little uh, with all of our actions, we show that we meant as, uh, as an interacted with community. We realize that children uh, are very important in these processes, that, that planners should establish positive and open relationship with kids. Involving the, ki the kids of La Campana was, was done over and over, and was with, we had established trust through the visioning workshop and park naming exercise, such as this one, the kids were committed. And this enthusiasm provided necessary momentum and had the secondary effect of involving and keeping the adults aware. So whatever there's kids, there's the parents that are with them, of course. So another thing very important for us was to listening to the local knowledge, the local resources, the local skills. And we, we saw that they were very skillful with work with wood, and also with, in construction, this was made by, by, by one of the, of the neighbors. So we work with those abilities uh, and skills to incorporate it into our process. Um, by the end of the field work, our presence had ceased to be essential for the community success. The residents felt empowered to continue the work they had started, having meetings, Talking, talking, taking advantage of local resources, contributing anything and everything they, they have, time, money, raffle items, and loterias, and building the park according to their needs and priorities, and with the, their style and techniques. We just uh, keep in touch with a WhatsApp group where we received the, this, this was made after we, we went back to Austin, and and they sent us the, the progress of the park. They, we sent it back some uh, advices uh, of construction advices such as this one, 
uh, the, the second image here. And in the end, they, they send us this park functioning as a park where it was a landfill a couple of weeks ago. So we were really proud that the work continued without us. Um, something very important is that the without process of, of action research practitioners is always delicate and difficult, leaving a place where one has learned, work, established friendships, and ultimately becoming part is not, is not easy. Both sides can feel an uncomfortable sensation of loss, and finally, um, at the end of the field work can also be a particularly difficult stage for the community as they may lose momentum and uh, as things go back to normal. Um, to, to deal with this, we, we created this self and group reflection of what we learn, and, and, and this is something that we are iterating uh, constantly with it. As a conclusion, conclusion that settles on informal informal uh, settlements are natural planners that's that's for sure and and the idea of this studio was not to and, and this research was not to help or produce for them but learn from from their already existing community-based planning practices and, and and use and use them and, and work with them this is now the park is getting prettier and prettier we are still in touch with this community and they, the last photograph they, they were sent us, they, they were paint, painting a mural in the, in, on, this, on this wall on the back. So this is something that I wanted to share with you, this, this research that uh, is on the middle, and, and that, that will be all by, my, by me. Thank you. What a great story. So if there's a like question, uh, maybe one person, because we don't have that much time. Now, could you share with us how um, the ways in which you've noticed the sustainability of the endeavor uh, beyond the involvement of um, the, the researchers? So you mentioned it earlier on in the presentation, but what are some of those, what does that look like? What are some of the manifestations of the, the fact that you, you feel like this is an endeavor that's going to keep, have energy beyond the involvement of the scholars? Well, the, the main thing is that they, the, the first thing was that they continued working without us and, and they felt empowered to do it because all, that, all the skills that we use and all the processes that we, that we established over there were with the community. So when we, we came back to Austin, uh, it was only natural for them to continue this process. And another thing I think very important uh, about this is that this uh, NGO is still working there and they are looking for another spots in other parts of La Campana of, of this informal settlement to continue the work with them. Thank you. Great. Um, so let's thank Leon or Leon, I should say. And then um, the next presenters are like Rachel and Ronald. All right, hey folks, I'm gonna share my slides and I think Donald's the first one who's going to speak to them. So we'll get this going. I like that, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm your, your right hand lady. <laughs> Good, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm Donald King. I'm a, a community architect here in Seattle. Uh, and an affiliate professor of architecture at the University of Washington College of Built Environments. Uh, the, uh, and I need the, the, uh, the Montlake campus, as we call it, not the Tacoma <laughs> campus. Uh, happy to hear of your work uh, and like to make a connection with you on, on what we're doing here in Seattle, too. Um, the story of the Nehemiah Initiative and building beloved community within uh, the Seattle uh, Central District is, it begins as a, as a conversation. This conversation um, nearly three years ago between a developer that wanted to purchase property from a church and the church leader, um, the, the pastor and, and, and bishop uh, of, the, of the church um, said he did not want to sell that 
uh, he was not happy with other churches in the central district that were selling and moving out due to the pressures of gentrification and this, the, the displacement of the black community. So uh, between the two of them, they had a long discussion and conversation about the assets of the traditional black church in Seattle and how uh, the threat of the loss of the church was a threat uh, of the, the, the loss of a great chunk of the community and a community asset. Um, the uh, seven of the, of the largest churches, uh, the traditional black churches in central Seattle um, have about seven acres of property uh, worth about $65 million. Most of that property is available for development. It is uh, what we would consider surplus land. It's parking lots, uh, surface parking lots, and, and other pieces that are under, underdeveloped in an area of high demand for property. Uh, in areas where there is displacement of uh, uh, previously black owned homes and businesses and then institutions and those institutions uh, later became uh, the, the threat and the loss of the churches. And the churches and the history of uh, African American churches, if you don't know it, is also the history of the foundation of, um, of African American com communities post uh, slavery. So the uh, the the the, the raw black communities for both uh, newly arrived residents into a city where they would go is they would go to the church. The church was the community organization. It was the the uh, functioning asset for for the community. Uh, so the saving of these churches was critical in the saving of the last. Uh, African-American residents of, of Seattle. Uh, so we actually had a great opportunity because the churches, as I said, actually owned property. They had assets. They were property rich, but they were cash poor. They were also not knowledgeable enough about development that they uh, were really reluctant to get involved in it themselves. Uh, I being an advocate for this uh, for a number of years, um, met with the, the developer and, and the bishop that I mentioned earlier, and we started coming up with ideas for how we engaged with the churches uh, and to let them know that there was help, there were ways that we could uh, help them stay in place, uh, be an asset for the community, be a, a place for the development of affordable, of affordable housing, of affordable business spaces that were being lost to them and how that could actually help stabilize the displacement and possibly even bring other African-Americans back into Seattle. Part of our approach on this was the idea of beloved community and Martin Luther King's idea of beloved community in being a, a reconciliation uh, force uh, in in the uh, the process of all the harm that had been done in black communities from from redlining to urban re urban removal as we would call it urban renewal uh, and now most recently the displacement through gentrification how do you begin to reconcile and make peace with that damage that has happened to a population that oh, for over a hundred years now has become the prototype for urban population. Uh, how do you then adjust what is happening to African Americans who are now becoming non-urban? Um, and, and how do we uh, make sure that we have communities that are truly integrated communities and not uh, monolithic white and upper income? Rachel, did you want to go to the next slide or did you want to sure. now introduce how the Nehemiah Initiative worked its way into the University of Washington College of Built Environments? Yes, I will try to do that. So uh, the Nehemiah Initiative formed out of the work of the Bishop and Donald and other initial founding members. And this is a, a group that has connected 
Um, sorry, my timer just went off, so I'm going to speak quickly. Um, sorry. So the Nehemiah Initiative formed towards the end of uh, around October 2018, and because Donald and I know each other through the college, um, we started talking about ways to bring some of the work forward in a studio and fi find ways to bring the College of Built Environments at the University of Washington Montlake campus uh, into service um, or into the service of the Nehemiah Initiative. So um, one of the ways that we're doing that right now is that we are in partnership with the Nehemiah Initiative working towards a, a focus on beloved community development and thinking about for partner clients that are churches, um, what would be the highest and best beloved community use? So that's a play on, you know, highest and best use in uh, real estate language. And, and what this means is a focus on, um, whoops, I just need to go back one if I can. There we go. So this means um, going into partnership with the church clients ahead of time, starting with assets and desires that they have about redeveloping their properties to stay in place and to thrive as community churches. And it, 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 so far it has also meant really talking a lot about near-term and long-term financial sustainability. Um, and what our studio has done so far, and Donald and I co-teach it, and we are joined by one of our faculty members in real estate, um, is that we are developing site plan schematic building designs and pro formas for each uh, church partner. And our hope is that we will provide something that is valuable and becomes a springboard for that church then to continue in its own development process. Um, we are joined in this effort by our Dean, Renee Cheng. Um, she teaches a one credit seminar that's layered into our studio on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And the focus is on intercultural communication, helping train the students and as faculty to better relate to one another and to relate to the client and relate to the community. So I'll just stop there uh, in case there are any questions. How are you planning to use the current moment of racial justice movement to support this project? Clara, I think that was you. I couldn't see you. Yes. Um, hi. <laughs> um, that is an excellent question. And I think it comes down to community control of land. And, and not only how are, how are we encouraging churches to hold on to their own land, and supporting them as they think about how to redevelop so that they can better use their property and stay there and grow. Um, we're hearing from um, members of the initiative that they want to work on affordable housing, affordable commercial, um, you know, worship spaces, recreation space, that's one. I think another way that the Nehemiah Initiative in relationship to the CBE or the College of Built Environments can be effective is helping to advocate for transfers of surplus land into the African American community in Seattle. And in fact, I, Africa Town, I think was just granted a former fire station to date to turn into a community center. And Donald, it sounds like you know more about that. Yeah, that has been in the process for years now. And what uh, both Africa Town and uh, uh, the Nehemiah Initiative has is uh, we have a vision in place and uh, we now uh, see opportunities for people to to actually help us with that. Uh, it's become more visible. It's not like we've got to come up with something when people say, what can I do to help? And we say we have something in place now that, that really requires the funding. As I said, these churches are property rich but cash poor, which leaves them a little stymied in how they take the first step in, in, in a development process. Mm -hmm. so the University of Washington has been helpful in, in, in showing them that way and pro providing that guide, but also being a resource that isn't going to leave them, as we'd heard from Leon in the, in the previous presentation, uh, to, to make that commitment. Uh, and it has with, uh, I believe we're going to be going into our fifth studio uh, that has uh, had the focus on the Nehemiah Initiative mm -hmm. uh, in this autumn's quarter. Yeah, and just a, a quick uh, response to Evis's question in the chat, which is a really good one. Do we know of a development school for community members? 
Um, we've been talking about this idea. We don't know of one. And so we've really, we've talked a lot about like a development 101. We are trying to do that informally now um, in some ways with the students um, in terms of their knowledge, with increasing development knowledge within the community. Um, but it's a great idea. We do, we, we want to get there and we need to get there. If anybody knows about um, community-based development schools, kind of how to manage and um, manage and lead in terms of community control of land and how you do the kind of development you want on that property, we would love to know more about any, any examples of that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, we do it now in more or less an informal way by engaging these churches in our studios uh, as clients, they begin to learn more about the process. They begin to learn the terminology. They begin to understand uh, the costing of projects and, and, and what is uh, a, a, a deficit cost and what is, a, is an added, uh, added benefit to the church uh, to help it survive also from the development of its property. Well, um, wonderful. And thank you for answering my question. <laughs> sure. Um, this so is a great question. The next one uh, presenter is like Leonor. Um, well, Leonor um, says up. Um, I just wanted to like mention that um, partnership is like a way that um, developers also try to like do technical assistance. Um, and I have seen some of that in Puerto Rico, so we should talk more. Okay, Leonor. Oh, she's using um, captioning.
Hi, everybody. So, small little experiment on having to read what was happening here um, on the screen. So again, this was also purposeful. So more of, not of a limitation, but of an asset on how actually people learn and how people pay attention or not pay attention. Also, small little note, I also forgot to unmute myself. So go figure that. So thanks everybody. Well, that was a uh, wonderful Leonor. I wonder if there's like uh, maybe one question for Leonor because we have one more presenter. That was very refreshing, I have to say. Questions or? Maybe thoughts? Uh, it was having a thought. I was thinking about how this question of, or definition of disability is changing because of COVID. You know, that's a great question. Um, in the disability community, we talk about this all the time and how um, all these facilitators and barriers or people with disabilities were never allowed financially couldn't be done and now with COVID it's opening up a brand new world of integration and communication and accessibility that wasn't allowed when also with respect to COVID we don't know what that does to your body but we do know that people with COVID are starting to have physical limitations and they're not being up to par so when we look at the medical model social model Right now, COVID is in a very dangerous place in the disability community because we see the medical model right now being prevalent on what can be done and so much control. And so we're just kind of looking to see how policies at the local and national level and internationally are being played out and how inclusivity starts to occur. Well, thank you, Leonor. That was um, wonderful. Um, so our next presenter is uh, Carol. And you're okay. mute. Yes, I mute myself. Good evening, everyone. Let me see if I can share my screen. Ah, there we go. So. I cannot uh, see anything. Oh yeah. I, you can see it now? Okay. So um, Carol Archer with the University of Technology, Jamaica, um, Kingston, Jamaica, uh, urban planner, I uh, teach a course on community development, urban governance. And um, this project, the story I'm telling of this project came out of work that we started in 2017. And we um, included it as the tool for the course on community development, which is one of the um, courses for the urban and regional planning um, BSc. <clears throat> I have my colleague, um, Anithia Jackson, joining us. We're, I'm telling the story, let me just start at the beginning. Right. I'm telling the story of a particular project which we worked on in a place called Nagel's Head which is in the most concentrated urban community in the Caribbean. Um, it, that community is called Portmore St. Catherine. The project <clears throat> was um, supported by Habitat for Humanities International and the, the agency, the US, um, USAID after. The fo focus on the project was to really address disaster resilience in the community and we use the um, asset-based community development approach to um, assist with the preparation of a community development uh, redevelopment plan and to actually make recommendation in addition to preparing the plan to make recommendations as it relates to some next steps. Um, one of the next steps which we will speak on or highlight is the community land trust model that came out of this. 
Nago said <clears throat> in Portmore is an informal, um, what we refer to as potter settlement in, <clears throat> in, in, in Jamaica. And the attempt was to address this most vulnerable community because whilst Portmore is the most concentrated urban area, it is also most vulnerable to natural disasters, hurricane, earthquake, sea level rise, um, so forth and so on. So um, with the support of the USAID and Habitat for Humanities International, looking at addressing disaster risk reduction and sustainable development goal 11, they engaged the university, um, my department, to um, work with the community. The community <clears throat> focus addresses issues associated with the new urban agenda, um, specifically around issues of participatory, um, civic engagement, <clears throat> sense of belonging and ownership. Those were the key drivers of, of the project. And of course, we use the asset-based participatory learning and action approach to, um, to achieve this. The, the process through extensive engagement, um, working with the community, working with um, other major stakeholders, there were six um, issues that were identified, environment and risk reduction, education and social services, physical infrastructure, social capital and, and capacity building, shelter, land use, and economic development. We focused on the issue of land use and um, economic development, which led us to a recommendation, which hopefully I will discuss um, at the end. <clears throat> so um, the, the, the community residents were uh, developed and were engaged in the overall objectives of the project, um, identifying the priorities for action, categorizing the strategy, strategies, and how to, outlining how it will be measured um, in terms of the success of the strategies, how they were going to measure them. Um, <clears throat> we we uh, worked with the community residents to do SWOT analysis. Uh, we had um, constant engagement and communication at various fora to um, discuss the findings. This was also positioned within the context of a legal um, legislative framework for Jamaica, which is a local sustainable development plan. So we wanted, um, the community advised us that they wanted a document that they could serve to the government and that would direct how development would take place in Jamaica. So we used the local sustainable development <clears throat> process, which is a new piece of legislation which was enacted in 2017. Um, this outlines the sustainable development process, the visioning, the education, the audit, the identifying the early actions, the consultation, the action planning, the monitoring and evaluation and so forth. So that was included in the, in the process. Um, as, we go th as we had gone through the process, we, we um, noticed there were several challenges that we had to overcome in addition to preparing this um, sustainable development plan, this redevelopment plan, there were some other deeper entrenched issues, one of which was the land ownership and land tenure. As I said before, this was an informal community, so there is no access or um, ownership of the land. Um, it's one thing to prepare um, a redevelopment plan, but it's a whole nother ball game, I can tell you, to address the ownership of land in a, a, um, a community that has been marginalized and limited um, financial assets. So we had to work with the community to come up with an approach to address the issue of land ownership and, and tenure system. So um, we realized that it was one thing to, to focus on slum upgrading. Uh, the slum upgrading that, we that the community agreed to was that one that focused on physical improvement and development of the local economy. And again, driven by security of tenure and land use regularization. Um, right? 
So we realized that this, the tenure insecurity issue was critical. And it was critical because it is by um, addressing the issue of tenure regularization that we would be able to address issues of um, disaster um, resilience and how they can re recover from um, disaster, which the, the area is prone to. Now, having completed the redevelopment plan, which would guide the development of the area, the community then turned to the university and said, look, there's a difficulty that we had, and that is how do we access our land? Now, initially, um, we looked at um, given individual tenure. Let me just um, skip down to that. Right. So when we went through the process to give individual title, I'm hoping you're seeing on the screen the actual cost. Um, and we had the US equivalent for the actual cost for individual title. This was prohibitive. So we then looked at an approach. We looked far and wide and we saw a model that was widely used in the US, which was the community land trust model. And I know a two or three of my colleagues earlier mentioned about it. Now, this has never been um, implemented in the Caribbean, much less Jamaica. And so the issue of land ownership had to be given some consideration, which um, we are actually now working through that. And I would be happy to discuss with, um, with you as to how best to go about um, establishing a community land trust um, for the community, for an informal um, community. The, what we are proposing based on the research that um, Ms. Jackson and I have done, we looked at a model that was mission centric, that focused on community development um, organization who would own a limited liability company, and they would develop a social enterprise model that will help to offset the cost associate so the land would be in trust to the the community-based organization but it would also be a social enterprise model um the, the the this would be to reduce with the aim of reducing um tenure insecurity but also to build um resilience and address issues of disaster mitigation and disaster management um, we've outlined, and this was a coming out of conversations with the community, that yes, we have built coming out of the redevelopment planning process, we have enhanced the engagement and ensure active participation. We were limited with the regularization, so we now need to create a strategic alliance, public-private, to ensure that the ownership of land rather than individual title will be in trust with the community, right? Um, so the, this trust, coming community land trust would provide a steady cash flow for income generating activities to subsidize costs for the land regularization. It would enable the access of technical support for land tenure regularization. So it's rather than giving individual community residents and this community, I believe we had about 750 households that we were working with, um, low income individuals without the necessary um, financial asset. They had other assets and of course the land being one of, of them that we wanted to, to, to capitalize on. In fact, what we're looking at is the, um, one of the, the facilities um, operated in the community, which is the community center. Um, in fact, they have significantly redesigned the center. This was pr at the time when we did the redevelopment plan. They have now turned this into an office and we are recommending that the trust um, operate from, from that site because they are, they are already in, um, in operation. So we, we know that the community, it's an important um, a necessary approach to take. It has not been done and we need to do, and we're currently doing research on it. What we're 
and I'm happy for this session to reach out to my colleagues um, from across the globe to get some ideas as to how to best implement it. We have a structure based on what we've seen, particularly coming out of the US, um, a board of directors, all run and managed by the community because community residents, as I said before, the, doing the redevelopment plan, the capacity of the residents have been heightened to be able to manage and operate um, the trust. And they were the ones who proposed a structure. So what we need to do now is to look at um, how best to um, flesh out the organization so that it can be a registered company um, and then become a vehicle for regularizing and empowering the communities of Nagozet. So um, I don't know if I have much time left, but in Jamaica, we have been working with the several communities through the universities using the, um, the asset-based community development approach. And um, this one is in Nagoza is the most recent one. We have published on um, the university's work in the immediate environment of where the university is located in, in Papine. Um, work that we have done in those communities in and around the university using the asset based approach, but we wanted to focus on this one because of the what we see as an innovation coming out of it, which is a, the, um, the community land trust. Um, so I, I want to stop here to take questions and have a discussion as to, you know, the best approach. But before I go, let me just um, provide here, and I will share the, the, the PowerPoint with the group. Um, there's a YouTube video that tells the story of the project, um, and I've listed it here. And there are some other um, blogs about the work that we have been doing, and I've also listed it here. So with that, let me um, stop share and open for questions. Yeah, I mean, we have time for one question, but then after, right after that, if you can also like copy and paste um, yes. in the chat, that yes. would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a question for, for Carol. Uh, Carol, that was excellent. Thank um, you. I'd like to talk to you more about it and the Community Land Trust in the way of a model that we're thinking here involving a, a social enterprise that is actually more of an investment for the residents mm -hmm. as, as ownership of the Community Land Trust. Because many of the challenges we found with Community Land Trust is someone owns the Community Land Trust, but it's not necessarily the residents or the community mm -hmm. members. Right. So how do we really get that into joint ownership and investment in their own community and right, yeah. thereby having actual shares in their community. Right. I don't know if Trisha, thank you for that, Donald. I don't know if Trisha wants to add real quick. Um, I was going really fast, Trisha. So hopefully I've captured everything that we've been doing so far. Trisha, you want to add anything? I, I don't know if Trisha, you have to mute, unmute. Oh, I did. Okay. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I think Dr. Archer covered um, the, the project. It was very exciting for us to work with the community. Um, I think one of the things I, uh, that would be quite engaging for us to talk about in another forum would be just those sessions with the, the, the women in the community and the, ah, the, yes. the, yes. in the community. And they were, they were quite excited, had, had several ideas about how we could use the social enterprise model, taking advantage of their unique skills and talents and so on. So not just the land, but also the human resources that resided in these communities, very rich. Yes, yes, and that, that was key to um, the discussion uh, yeah, that emerged into, because they're saying, look, we can't get enough at this time to earn, to put towards the, the ownership of the land but if we had it in, in, in a, the community, in a trust, then we can literally, something that we've been practicing here in the Caribbean, which is 
coming out of our African tradition, the the um the partner, the SUSU, or the you know the pooling together of of funds for these kinds of um, development, whether it's constructing a home or sending someone to school. Um, so we have that tradition and the women in particular were quite excited about that as one of the assets that they brought to the table. Thanks for that, Trish. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have like five minutes just to end the session, um, but I don't want it for us to go before thinking about what were some of the themes that emerged in this session. So based on the chat, I think, you know, and all the conversations is like land trust is pretty much like the, a good example of like community control, right? Um, and asset-based community development. And that's why it came up so much in this like conversation. Um, so that's like a theme that I see, but I was wondering if other people see other, other themes. I would like to share what some of the main things that kind of like connect um, some of these conversations and stories that we just talked about. Oh, one of the themes that I, I think is very useful is the, 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 the history and the, the documenting of the, the local memory. Um, that is an, is an asset that oftentimes is overlooked. I think there are about three or four of the presentations that, that spoke to that. Uh, I think we need to highlight it. Yeah, and, and can I also add to that? one thing that it, we've been discovering is that uh, for community activists now to reach out to folks uh, due to because of the pandemic uh, in order to raise awareness and to to you know tell people to use a mask or to quarantine they have been using also this kind of they've been pleading to the love and the care that people feel about the community so one of the people i've been talking to said you know, you can't just call somebody and be like, why aren't you home? You, you can call them and be like, you know, remember that time that we went out? Or <laughs> so they're, they're trying to use these strategies of uh, good memories and uh, making people think about the past and also think about the future of a happier future. And, and then they introduce this whole like, okay, well, you know, you should stay home. Uh, so it's a different way of also manipulating this kind of like sense of attachment, right, that comes from history. So I've been finding that quite interesting. An another theme that I saw that was that was really encouraging was most of you talked about uh, community engagement and empowerment of communities in a way that uh, we as educators can provide resources and knowledge to communities but are able to also get out of the way so communities can take control of their own destiny uh, and still yet be there if there was anything else that, that they needed, but we were not leading, you know, it was the community leading. So how do we empower communities to do that so they also begin to learn to continue to do that and other things uh, from the process? I would add to that that I heard in a couple, in several, several presentations, the activist is scholar, the scholar is activist, balancing the load between um, their, using their skills and talents as members of the communities that they're working in, but also ba balancing that with the institutional demands of, of, of um, sustain, sustaining themselves in ways that they can use those talents um, in the way you just uh, mentioned, Don, Donald. Sure, and I'd like to add, I think, uh, on that line is that our, um, our responsibility as academics is not just to stand out of the way, um, but also to make those uh, unique connections to important uh, stakeholders in the community, if it's governments, is it philanthropic, uh, if, it, if it's the media, but being able to provide those connections to let communities speak for themselves. And I think that's an important role that we have as academics and privilege that we have in some of the institutions uh, that we're affiliated with as well to give us that opportunity. I think that urban planning, urban planners in general and 
ABCD practitioners in particular feel a mandate to be invested in not only understanding the world and contributing to explaining it as many disciplines participating, but also transforming it. So the commitment to transform the world, to conceive of an inch closer to the world that we envision would be more just and more equitable and more sustainable, I think is something that unites all of this presentation together. Now, Evis may have some ideas about that, but I think it is great the format that this conference has had in which many of us, of us have been able to share the work that we're doing in short amounts of time so that we have hurt each other. And, and now we have this conversation about, you know, similarities and differences between projects and, and approaches. Uh, but I hope it can go forward and perhaps become a compilation of an edited book or a special uh, issue in a journal. I know that the project have, are at different stages of development, but I don't think that's a barrier for the type of conversation that the collection allows when, they, when all the programs and projects are put together. And on that same vein of conversation of people interested in this type of topics, uh, Lara and I, together with another colleague of ours, are, are organizing a conference that is happening virtually next week on Friday for the full day on decolonizing urban planning in Latin America. And it will have 14 presentations in three different panels of people participating from Europe, uh, North America and Latin America in general. I hope that you uh, that you're interested and some of you join us for that dialogue as well. Mm -hmm. Can you share that, Clara, with uh, us by by the link? If it's not already. I just put the link of the where the YouTube uh, video. We are going to stream it live on YouTube, and you can access it there. Um, and if you want to share like other things like outside of the chat, um, I can collect those because it will take a little bit of time to collect everything. So if you want to share like papers or like other conferences, um, I also have like a, um, actually like I, I posted it, but it's like a call for papers um, for societies. It's due very soon in June 15. But I think that one of the beautiful things is that um, at least with the planets of color and like linking that to ABCD is that now we are assets to each other, right? Yeah, so it's yeah. like academia, it's like, you know, some people have to look at or review our work at some, at some point and uh, we can actually like put, um, I, I will take like Clara's idea and now we have to do it like a special issue <laughs> uh, on this. I know like Clara is an amazing writer and like editor and organizer um so i i i feel like um that this is like the beginning of of something um inside of like uh planners uh groups and abcd so with that um i just wanted to say thank you again for like presenting and sharing your stories um i learned a lot i'm sure everybody learned a lot um, and, and now we are, we are a thing, we are a group. <laughs> um, and I also want uh, to thank you. Yes. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Thank you. It was Happy great to see everyone. Clara. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ives. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> Feliz cumpleaños. Thank you, Clara. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Uh -huh. Ciao. Okay,